Uh, I want to thank Ken for inviting me and the great guys here at Sarah. You guys are really lucky down here in southern Alberta. You guys got a great research group here. They do a lot of good stuff and uh, coming out and taking advantage of things like this um, I think are great and they can really help us out for our bottom line and uh, in our farm even if we can everybody can take one or two things away you know each tour they go to like this it'll really help us out so um, today we're just going to talk about some uh, a few trials that we have I'm going to talk about um, a little bit of speed depth and um, seeding rate and then we're going to move over to some fertility stuff and then we're going to talk a bit on some insects um, I think it was a week ago or maybe even two weeks ago we were out here um, and uh, Ross had put together some information just to kind of give us an idea of where we are and like we discussed earlier we had great warm soil conditions coming in and uh, we had good moisture conditions and that's what happens when you try to put a plot together and show the difference between the, the diagnostics. Um, everything just kind of came up really nice this year. Um, Anytime we give you advice on depth, speed, seeding rate, um, it's just kind of tools in your toolbox to improve your plant stance just so then we can uh, you know, maximize our yield. Um, so here we have a few trials. This one we're going uh, excessive speed, so we're seeding at 12 miles per hour. I think this is with a... Kilometers. Sorry, kilometers. <laughs> this, is with a, this is with a disc, um, and this is with a... Uh, this is with a hoe, yeah. So as you can see, we're getting like uh, seed bouncing around and you know, not everything's kind of where it should be um, for, for plants. And um, you know, when we have plant stands like this, it's, uh, it makes it a bigger issue later in the year. We have uh, more weed control we have to worry about. So um, herbicide becomes an issue. And then uh, that's when we get the canola plants to start to branch out more. And when we do get that branching out effect, uh, it makes it a lot harder to make that fungicide decision later or that swathing decision. Um, so that's kind of what we're showing here is we move over, what is our speed here, Ken? Six. So this is six and it's uh, kind of hard to tell the difference in some, but um, it's just kind of one of those years where everything sort of popped up like we discussed earlier where everything sort of come up so when we do do these diagnostic field schools it's a lot more difficult to see the difference. On the handouts you, you have too, you'll notice we did do multiple plant counts and there are some, still even though visually sometimes it's hard to pick out some significant differences in plant stats. So. so here they did um, plant counts on this bar graph here and um, at six kilometers per hour you can see we're at uh, you know about eight, eight and a half plants per square foot or 85 per square meter and then once we do bump up that speed we're down to about seven plants per square foot. The Canola Council of Canada we uh, recommend in between seven to 14 plants per square foot. On some research that Murray Hartman put together, our canola oil seed specialists, um, at 10 plants per square foot is your optimal plant stance. You can reach up to 90 percent of your potential yield even on an unfavorable year, even those years where you get maybe um, you know, once once the crop's established, everything kind of goes goes wrong. But you know, there's always outliers. You know, if everything goes wrong, you're likely not going to get 90% of your potential. Um, and what was this? This was with the hoe here. The, the two, first two plots are with a paired row stealth opener, and then the next two are with the pillar laser opener. So. I guess my, my experience so far is that when it comes to canola establishment, I really do like the ind independent depth control that those disc type openers have. And there's some new fancy ones now with automatic hydraulic pressure setting. That's kind of a good thing when it comes to precise depth control, which is actually our next plot. But um, on the other hand, my experience has been that seedbed utilization when it comes to canola establishment is important too. And, and often we see that spreading that seed out in a bit of a band has given us better establishment. Uh, to, to follow up on that, there's a really big project that we were actually hoping to tour at this very crop walk that's going on at the Ag Tech Center. Uh, Ag Canada and the canola cluster is, is looking at about 12 or 10 to 12 different openers trying to figure out you know, what's the best way to, to get the 
optimum canola stand. So they're looking at speed to seating like this with different openers. You know, like uh, Josh has a John Deere disc opener. He can actually get away with seating quite a bit faster than a guy with a paired row cell. You know, what are those, you know, combination of factors that will help growers, you know, sort of cut, well, maybe not cut costs on seeds, but optimize their, their profits when it comes to seed control. So, seed control, yeah. This yeah. year, with the amount of moisture we've had, we've had a lot of safening, but I honestly think that we've had better, uh, visually better stands with our paired row, whereas last year I would have said the narrow, the narrow knife type thing was better. So, yeah, what happens, what I find with openers is certain conditions, Certain ones will perform better, and that's always the case. So it's always a blend of, uh, of those types of things. Sorry, Chris. Oh, that's great. Thanks a lot, Ken. Anybody have anything else to add? Any questions out of anything like this? Um, you know, I like the dialogue or any, everybody's own experiences. And certainly feel free to walk right up into the yeah. and take a look. They're not taking these to yield, so you can, but there's not really much. Um, other than that, yeah, that's, um, we always like to get that, uh, you know, that seeding speed right. So then we're not, uh, our, our biggest challenge is crop establishment. Once we get our crop established, that's 90% of our challenge, I think, at the beginning of the season. And then the rest, a lot of it's mother nature, you know, and then a few things, decisions like fungicide and insecticide. But, um, so yeah, that's kind of our big challenges. If we can get it out of the ground and get that 10 plants per square foot, we're, uh, we're looking really good and we set ourselves up, lower our risk. Um, I think, what are our next plots here? Can. So here we have depth moving over. Um, I think we're three centimeters, which is uh, just over an inch, about an inch and a quarter. So, um, you know, lots of guys think that they can cut their seeding rates, and, and sometimes you can, but you really want to make sure that you're, you're doing everything else right. But uh, when you, oh, sorry, this is depth. Sorry, when, when we're seeding too deep, a lot of people think that, uh, you know, they're at that accurate one inch, um, but you really got to go out and check and make sure that, you know, you're not at that inch and a quarter. It's not like a pea or, or even a cereal where, you know, you can plunk it in a little bit deeper, go to moisture. Pea, you can seed anywhere from three inches to an inch, I think, and it's going to come up pretty easily. So, but uh, canola, that, uh, that half inch, um, a lot of guys tell me, they say, you know, I always look for a little bit of the blue seed on top, you know, the... So, you know, when you're walking your fields and if you see a little bit on top, then you're likely close to the right depth. But here we have, um, I think this is at a one centimeter. So what would that be? Just, just about a half an inch. Yeah, just less. Yeah. So this is, this is an ideal depth, I think, for canola, especially a year like this where we got that nice rain come in right away and, and our crop establishment was great. So, um, you know, it's... It definitely needs, I think it just got sprayed with a uh, Roundup yesterday or the day before, Ken was saying, so, you know, it doesn't, a little bit of barley showing up. And, um, but yeah, our, um, our depth is a big factor for stand establishment. So we need the, that canola to be up at that half inch, top half inch. Questions, comments, sarcastic remarks? Um, the last thing that I wanted to show you guys that I thought that was kind of important was um, seeding rate. Lots of us uh, try to cut down on our seeding rate. There's a lot of new seeders out there that are telling guys, uh, you know, we can drop our seeding rate down to, you know, three and a half pounds per acre. Um, and you know, a lot of that has to do with your equipment, with your speed of seeding, and also your date and your soil temperatures. If I was going to be seeding, um, you know, like April 15th and the soil temperatures were still around that five degrees, I likely wouldn't drop my seeding rate down to three and a half. That's when you'd want to, you know, bump it up if anything. But if you're in there um, uh, May 15th, your soil temperatures are at above eight, you know, and you're going a nice speed of, let's say, three and a half, four mile an hour, and you're ensuring that seed at that half inch, you're going to increase your emergence. Um, so that's maybe when I would drop my seeding rate, if ever. Um, and you know, it's a good idea even to do trials like that. So we've got great seeding equipment now. We've got GPS, we've got yield monitors in our combines. So even set up 20 acres on the side, mark a few swaths in the fall, and then you'll know if, if it's worth it, you know, if, if a person can make a good stance. 
And uh, just because it worked one year doesn't mean it's going to work every year either. You know, we like replicated trials and, and see what happens over five or ten years. But um, for, um, for a situation like this, yeah, I think that, uh, you know, when we're trying anything, even if it's a micronutrient or if we want to try to apply a little bit more um, liquid fertilizer at the five leaf stage, leaf check strips, you know, we want to know if this stuff is worth it and if you guys are uh, making money. Um, making money by the pro with the product that you're applying. So we'll move over here. Um, we have, uh, I think it's six pounds per acre seeded, five, four, three, two, and one. And um, yeah, we'll come over and take a look at these. So right in here is kind of where I want everybody to take a look on these two. It's kind of the main I think we're at four and three pounds here. KGs so, per oh, hectare. kgs per hectare. So, it's almost the same. It's almost the same? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I don't know my conversions all that well. 1.123. 1.123. So, um, this is like three and a half pounds to four and a half pounds, I guess. Something like that. Um, so, when we do drop our seeding rates, you know, and we are trying something like that. Now's the time to go out and check your fields and, you know, do your plant counts. See if you are getting your at least, you know, we want at least five plants per square foot. That's um, according to Murray Hartman's research, which I brought up earlier. That's uh, that research suggests that you need five plants per square foot to reach your your all your maximum yield of 100 percent. So. Um, so when we look at trials like this, I guess we can see that there's there's lots of open spaces, so weed control is likely going to be a factor later. We're going to get those plants that are really branching out, so that's going to be harder to make those later decisions. And then green seed, especially on the falls, um, you know, that seem to come a little bit early. Um, green seed could be an issue, so, you know, that's a, that's a big factor, a lot of money there when we drop from, a, you know, a number one to a number two or even three. Um, so, like I say, at the end, we're just over six pounds. Just over five, four, and then three, two, one pounds per uh, per acre here. Um, I don't think he's going to be taking these to yield, but um, it'll be interesting to see how they grow and uh, do the plant counts later. Any comments or questions on um, seeding rates? Uh, Scott Mears brings up a great point here. Um, you know, when we do have poor plant stance, our threshold numbers are likely lowered. You know, we can withstand 25% leaf defoliation with flea beetles. That's with an optimal plant stance. But once we drop our plant stance down to two plants per square foot, if we're getting 25% of those leaves um, disappearing, it's not going to take long for that flea beetle to decimate the crop. So thresholds get lower. Our entire um, management just becomes a lot more difficult without that plant stance. So like I say, 90% of your challenge is getting that crop established in that optimal plant stance. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about flea beetles, um, or? Well, I think just it's really obvious here that, that you get a concentration effect when you get less plants. You get more flea beetle damage per plant, right? Because there's less plants to feed on. Um, Ken was just asking, is this damage here, is that, is that some sort of cutworm? And it's most likely, those holes are most likely flea beetle feeding when the leaf was really small. And then as the leaf expands, then that just becomes a bigger and bigger hole. So, so you looks, see stuff like this it here. It looks like it might be some sort of other feeding, but it's most likely that it's flea beetle. And, and it's if you look through the plots, it actually gets worse as you get into the, the, the lower plant stands. And that's just strictly, you're diluting out the impact with the more plants. So your threshold, I absolutely agree with Troy, your threshold is likely lower here than it is up there because because, uh, because the damage is diluted out up there. How has cutworm been this year? I know they've had a few, I haven't spraying yet. Yeah, um... North we've been seeing them, but in, in this territory they haven't been popping up lots. I found some yesterday, I was touring some plots in Consort, um, and uh, they're still small, so they're still around half, three quarters of an inch. We cut them open, they're still green guck inside, so they're feeding, they're active, but um, not a lot south of Highway 9 um, that has been at threshold levels that we've had to spray for cutworms. I talked to a farmer in uh, 
at Strathmore uh, yesterday, and he had he had uh, some marginal areas where he might have he decided he's going to go put some some insecticide on some hilltops. But it's really marginal whether he should be doing it or not. So that's as far south as I've heard any significant feeding damage. So we get up into the into central Alberta, especially. Uh, West Lock areas, yeah. quite a few. Yeah, north of Edmonton. And, and yeah, now, lots. And, and up into the Peace as well. And this is something that you might want to pay attention to. Those of you who are growing peas, we're starting to get reports that redback cutworm is worse on pea stubble. So if you're grow, going into pea stubble, you want to pay particular attention to cutworm for cutworm damage. Okay, just, just a heads up. We haven't seen it in southern Alberta. It's something I suspected would we'd start to see because redback likes pulses, likes to lay eggs in pulses. So um, the next crop is the one that takes it on the chin, and they are starting to see that now in West Lock. I've asked you guys to watch for it, and they're just saying absolutely it's worse where there's pea stuff. So, and so um, to follow up to on that, um, like yeah. uh, sandier soils or south facing slopes, you'll see uh, often more. Um, activity there I guess and a lot of times they'll just follow the rows and they'll just clip off the plants one at a time so you'll look for wilted dead plants left uh, leant over and um, if you keep on looking up the row that's likely where you'll find the culprit right in there and we do have a protocol on um, putting them in a, a paper bag and delivering them to um, I can't remember Jeremy Julia Tammy or they can send them to or, my lab as well yeah. we're, we're rearing out the cutworms to see what species they get in so the vast majority of what we got last year, it's, cutworms are really hard to rear because they get damaged when you collect them, strange as that sounds. Because um, farmers are gentle when they collect yeah, them. Cutworms, they, right? they're, they're, yeah, because they're, they're loving and caring with cutworms, I could see that. <laughs> but uh, we have a hard time rearing them out. The vast majority of what we reared out last year was redback cutworm, but most of those were out of that central Alberta area. Yep. So we will rear them, Julia Tanny, uh, 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 Jennifer Attani. Jennifer Attani. Jennifer, I got the two mixed up again. Jennifer Attani up in the piece is also doing that. What about Humble? Jeremy Humble? Uh, I haven't heard of Jeremy's set up to do it. Oh, okay. Um, the other thing on cutworms, and it's a really great question, there's actually been a working group uh, created. Um, it's partially through the Canola Council's <coughs> efforts. Um, and then there's a Western uh, Canadian Pest Monitoring Working Group. And we've decided that we need to uh, do some more research on cutworms. So there's a working group actually putting forward a proposal for research funding starting this fall. So, so next year you'll start to see that in the field. So therefore the cutworm problem should all go away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as soon as you start trying yeah, to... Yeah, uh, Hector's involved. Though, well, yeah. well, it really works with Hector. And Hector, we do have Hector involved. Oh, okay. so, uh, just for yeah. that reason. Hector doing the treatment. Yeah, I think a problem is is we don't have enough information on cutworms. Um, there's just a little bit of a research gap there. So there's, um, listening to John Glavosky's webinar on the ACPC website, uh, there's 1,500 different species of cutworms in, uh, in the Western world, Canada. or Western Canada alone, yeah. But there's only about five or six that are really damaging to, uh, to our crops. So, um, but yeah, we need to know more about them. And usually, or before, I guess we thought there was only three, but I think Jennifer Otani find, found five different species in one field. So, um, you know, they're, they're active and they're all over. So if, if you, and it, it makes sense, Look at what agriculture's done in the past 20 years, where it's come from, the level of tillage we've, we've gone th from and to, um, the type of crops we're growing, uh, everything's changed. So it makes sense that with that many species out there that something's going to like this new situation better than, than they did before. So we are seeing new species in southern Alberta, we're seeing largely dingy cutworms. Yeah. So, um, um, that is, I'm convinced that's related to our tillage levels. It's also related to our cropping levels because dingy cutworm likes to lay eggs in cracks of old dried up plants. And amazingly enough, those cracks are most prevalent in canola. And we tend to see dingy cutworm on canola stuff. So when it was, but that's not, a, that's not a hard and fast rule, but that's what we tend to see. So that's the kind of questions that need to be pursued and, and get better answers on it.
And a lot of times, uh, or the research suggested that uh, they didn't fare as well in, in wet conditions. And last year, Saskatchewan had like biblical flood conditions and uh, still they still had major cutworms year, there. Um, so, so yeah, like Scott says, we're just doing a little bit more research. And things are to, changing, right? Uh, things are changing. A couple things I want to mention uh, before we leave the canola here. Um, this, this crop is a little bit behind some of the earlier stuff, right? There's, there is an earlier canola around. Um, but uh, what I'm seeing on the fields, and you can correct me if you're seeing it different, but I'm seeing a huge variation in, in canola crop uh, stage, right? I got everything from one, two leaf to starting to really cabbage up in the four or five leaf. Those crops that are early, early, they're gonna have massive cabbage seed pod weevil loads because they fly in in big numbers into, the, into those early fields. So this, this has always been the case, but it's gonna, be, it's gonna be more so this year with the variation in crop stages. So um, just scouting early and, and uh, getting a handle on that early is gonna be important. Um, the, the, the other thing I want to say is we've seen a trend to spraying earlier and earlier and earlier. Um, I think we have to be careful with that. Uh, I don't think that spraying in the bolting stage, the late, late uh, or in the early, uh, earlier even in the bud stage, I've seen people spraying. We don't have our full migration of the cabbage seed pod weevil yet. So you want to be a little bit more patient cabbage seed pod weevil won't start laying eggs until the the first pods are a half to three quarters of an inch long they want that size to guarantee that that's that it's a viable pod so they'll lay lay their eggs in, on there um, so you have a time window to make that decision to spray so the early spraying uh, you could very easily spray and then get a, a further migration of, of cabbage seed pod weevil so we want to play that a little bit the later we spray, the more likely there are some viable eggs that have gotten hatched and inside the pod, so we have to watch that. That And the later we go, we also get higher and higher levels of beneficial insects in the, in the crop. So we have to play those two things off. Um, the, the real culprit we're seeing is seed production. And Ken's gonna have a seed production field day here. We're seeing uh, insecticide go in with the last uh, herbicide spray and I really would like to discourage that that practice um, I don't think you're getting any benefit and and all you can do is damage if you're getting no benefit so um, if if uh, if you're from the seed production side and you want to have an argument with me I'd be welcome to, to have that argument but I I'm really concerned about that practice I think it's detrimental so um, I understand what the motivation is that's a very high value crop and we have to protect that value but we end up having to spray again anyway right so so work on your timing um, that's what uh, about all I had on cabbage seed pod weevil except for that if you're out scouting uh, for cabbage seed pod weevil I would really encourage you to register with us and get your uh, share some of the numbers from that scouting because we're, we're taking those numbers and mapping it and showing how the infestation, the outbreak is working through the province. It's a real-time live uh, mapping situation uh, done with Google Map. Um, all you have to do to register is just get me an email or, or Shelly, my technician, an email. Uh, give me your email address before we're done today and we'll get you signed up. And, all, and after that, it's just a phone call in or this year we have a uh, web page you can go in put the numbers in and, and send the web page in. So uh, we're, we're improving that, that as well. So a lot of people have the phones that you can get your browser out in the field. So we're going that way. In the long run, we're going to a fully interactive system where it'll actually put the GPS in for you. At this point, you have to do it manually. So, uh, but we will get to that point. Uh, that's planning for this winter. So. Um, we haven't gone to real-time outbreak mapping of wheat midge. We're, we're really concentrating on cabbage seed pod weevil. We'll see if we can make that work. Um, I, I hate to ask too much of agrologists, right? The more you ask, the less likely you're to get anything. So um, um, right now we're asking people if they could feed us 
if you go check 10 fields and you give us data on two, that's two more than we're getting, right? So right now we're concentrating on that. Next year, we'd like to go to cutworm reporting. Um, in the long run, we may go to wheat midge as well and ligus. Some of those things that emerge and are, are the issues emerge quickly. We'd like to see those so we can actually real time map them as they come up, right? So we've got all these people are in the fields. It takes, if we set it up so it's really easy, it takes you 30 seconds or a minute to, to share that data. Then that becomes, if everybody does it, it becomes very powerful and then we can track the outbreaks. That's what we're after, but um, we're, we're just catching up to the technology, I guess. So the ability is in my, like I have a, a smartphone, I have the ability in there, it has my GPS coordinates, right? So all we have to do is build applications that will read that, put in your name and your email address, and then you just have to put in your numbers and press send. So that's where we're gonna go with it, but we're, we're going a little bit at a time so we get it right. So, okay, yeah. Scott, um, with the higher pricing canola, is it, is the threshold level been changed at all? I, I think, yeah, that's, it's a question we have to revisit again. Uh, typically, the uh, threshold on cabbage seed pod weevil has been two and a half, or three to four per sweep. What price? Uh, but that, that, was, that was when we were talking six and seven dollar canola, right? That'd be about half that. So it, we're likely down in that, I would, I'd be reluctant to spray under two per sweep, but two and a half to three for sure. So, um, I mean, yeah, it, it makes perfect sense. So that discussion, I think, is it's timely, and we sh we need to get directive. That's a, one of my goals today is to talk to Troy, and and see how we're going to get that message in out. Same thing with Ligus, right? Ligus thresholds have been a mess. Honestly, they've been a mess. And uh, Hector's work and and work from other uh, entomologists are showing very clearly that we don't need to be going down to those really low numbers. But we also, we have guys, honest truth is last year we had people spraying uh, um, ligus at one per sweep all the way up to 10 per sweep was what they're using for thresholds. And so somewhere in there is the right number, <laughs> right? The actual threshold right now we're sitting at is two and a half per sweep, okay? So our 25 per 10. 25 per 10, I know that's the divide. How do you get half a, half a ligus? But the other really interesting thing that's happening is Hector Karkmo is leading the project on, on spraying for cabbage seed pod weevil and the impacts that's having on ligus uh, because we keep hearing from the industry that, that it, you're not spraying for ligus if you sprayed for weevil. And um, the first year's results are very supportive of that, that notion. Uh, we are looking for farmers again. I think we have a couple of guys in the crowd that are cooperating with Hector. But we're looking for farmers that are, have ability to yield map. Um, so um, we're looking to leave check strips and then we follow very closely the populations of those insects through the season and we take it right to yield. So last year, spraying uh, reduced ligus numbers reduced cabbage seed pod weevil numbers, and reduced diamondback numbers in, as compared to the checks. All three were going on with that one spray. So we may be onto something there, but what are the thresholds and how do we add them all together? There's a lot of work left to do. It's a four year project. We're just going into the second year. So if you have farmers or if you're farming and you have ability to yield map, we really want to talk to you about doing this. It's, I think this is, a, this is a really innovative project that Hector's come up with. It's in field, it's large scale so that you know, we don't have bot bleed from one to another. It's a, a very, very uh, positive thing. <coughs> so just a couple quick notes if I can, Ken. Diamondback moth numbers are way down from last year. Our trap catches are really low. Uh, they've just spiked up a little bit the last week. But what that's saying is we're very unlikely to have Diamondback of issue this year because it's so late getting that first spike. So, in fact, the Diamondback moth traps are all coming down this week. We're done. We're done. Uh, done with that. Bertha armyworm just goes up this week. Um, those are live maps on roping the web. 
Um, and as those numbers come in, then the map updates and, and you can see that. This year we have 135 sites across the province. So very well covered. Every county that's growing canola has, a, has at least one set of traps this year. So that's a first in the, in, for, Di or for Bertha. So that's a very, very good program. Um, we don't expect big issues in Southern Alberta. We're not sure in Central Alberta because we got some hot spots that showed up last year. They may grow or they just may disappear this year. So, but you can, has anybody doing Bertha this year? I know Troy is, okay. Um, we have 135 sites and probably 100 different agrologists and uh, farmers and uh, we've, we've even got a branch head from Alberta Agriculture that's doing one of the sites. So, I mean, we, we, anybody that said they'll do a site, we've got a site. So uh, it's very good. It's a very good predictive tool and we're getting very good uh, coverage on that system. So again, that's a, we've got a, how's the website working for data entry, Troy? Well, um, for Bertha's or for Diamondbacks? For, well, it's the same site. Um, the Diamondbacks is great. It's so yeah. easy. Um, Scott's uh, computer program, it's so nice. So you, all you do is you go out to your field, you count the numbers, and they send you a link to a website, and then it automatically comes up to date, and you just put in, I had 10 Diamondback Moths on Trap A, and then 12 on Trap B, and then you push save. So I just do it both with, via smartphone in literally three minutes after I'm done checking my traps. So it's so user-friendly. Um, you know, it's not uh, you have to call in or, you know, submit a report or anything like that count the numbers and then you can discard of the sticky traps as long as you can identify yeah. The, uh, yeah. the insect. So that's that's the way we're trying to go with all of our reporting to make it that easy. Uh, it takes it takes some programming. And the cell phone thing we've had trouble with applications because every phone is going to be slightly different, right? So you got to build an app that fits all the different types of phones. So but we're going to we're going to get there. That's that's one of the goals for next year. Any any questions on insects? Nice cell phone, cell phone ring. I wish they could whisper was yeah, you yeah. whistle that, did you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did anybody have any questions on wheat midge? Because I think that's the cabbage seed pod weevil and wheat midge, I think are the big ones that you're going to deal with this year. Um, wheat midge is new to many of us. So um, I think uh, one of the things we're going to be doing this, this year is we're going to do a video on, on sweeping in canola. And we're going to do a video on uh, scouting for midge and, and wheat. And those will be posted on YouTube. Alberta Agriculture has a YouTube channel all of its own. So um, that will help at least for the scouting, some of the scouting questions. So there's a YouTube out just on setting up the birth army room traps. We just yeah. as a test to see how that works. No, it's great. So. And, um, you know, uh, they're doing a lot of good things at Alberta Agriculture for video stuff that makes it a lot easier to, to I don't know, diagnose what you're doing or just even figure out uh, things like that. Um, the Alberta Canola Producers Commission right. has a great website. They do webinars. Um, they've got some YouTube videos growing with canola in, or um, radio spots and uh, lots of good information out there on the Alberta Canola website and the yeah. Canola Council and as well as uh, Roping the Web. So, any questions? We're doing our best. So we, if, if you have feedback on what we're doing, we welcome it. Uh, we've created a, uh, a steering committee. Troy's on our steering committee for the, the pest monitoring. And we really like give, give Troy the feedback and then he can hammer me at the meeting. Absolutely. But uh, we really want feedback because this is not my program. It's a program to help the industry, right? I call it my program because I have to call it something. But really, it's, it's about the industry. And the, everything we're doing is trying to make the information better accessible for the industry. So um, if, if you have information or questions or any, any concerns, uh, suggestions, we really, really welcome it because we're really trying to, we're trying to get the pest information back out to you as quick as we can so it's of some value to you. I remember doing birth armyworm survey when I started and the birthers would be eating the crop when, and we still didn't have the mapping and stuff out. So. We've come a long way from that. Okay. And for those of you who um, do seed canola and don't have the weekly canola watch, um, 
It's a free publication that the Canola Council puts out. I definitely uh, recommend anybody signing up for it. You can talk to me, I'll have a sign-up sheet at my truck and then I also have some good pamphlets on um, uh, sweeping and disease, canola diseases and um, time of swathing for canola as well. So I've got a lot of good information like that inside my vehicle. And then I've, I've put together a few packages for uh, insects that we're seeing this year. So if you guys want, I'll have them set up when we get the back into the area there. Well, Ken asked me just to talk with just the, uh, some of the nitrogen treatments here just for a couple of minutes. Uh, this particular treatment here had um, uh, 100 kilograms per hectare of uh, ESN seed placed. 100 kilograms per hectare is 90 pounds per acre. Uh, so that's 90 pounds per acre. Uh, ESN seed placed, this one here is uh, 90 pounds of straight urea seed placed. Now normally, this should look like a summer fallow, normally, uh, when you put that much with it. But moisture conditions have been extraordinary, and this just goes to show when you have great moisture conditions, you can put almost as much fertilizer with a seed and not have any problems. But if you do, if you kind of come over here and actually have a look, you can see that the stand here is actually better than the stand here. But this stand here is actually, you know, quite acceptable. But this is normally never what we'd recommend. This is a 90 pounds per acre. Normally, uh, if you look at the Canola Council information, they would say don't put more than uh, 15 pounds of actual land with, this, with a seed. And I'd even kind of think that's almost a little bit too much because some of our work is even showing at 15, you can get a little bit of injury especially if you're also putting on a bit of phosphorus and sulfur. I don't think I'd really want to go over about 10. So this is uh, 8 to 10 times the, the, the normal level. So again, this goes to show if you have phenomenal moisture conditions, uh, things can be very forgiving. Um, now, if you look on, on the handout here on, on the, the bottom of the second page, uh, Ken's actually done some uh, plant counts of all the different treatments. And uh, basically the three Actually, the four treatments that uh, have the best plant populations are three of them were side banded, agrotane side banded, urea side banded, ESN side banded, and then ESN seed place. Well, obviously, with a side banded, that fertilizer is far enough away from the seed, um, uh, things are fine. How and, far away? Uh, how far away was it, Ken? Uh, this particular plot was the stealth paired row opener, so it's usually about an, an inch and a half to two inch separation. And that's normally what you, as long as you're about an inch to an inch and a half away, normally you're, you're quite safe. Now we have done some work uh, in the past where if you, if, if you think you've got that inch to inch, inch and a half separation, but if your opener is worn, you may not have that, and then you run into injury. We actually run into, we have run into problems with injury with a stealth opener uh, if, if the openers are worn. So that's just a bit of a word of caution. Um, there is a treatment here that didn't get any nitrogen, which is probably worth having a look at. So uh, these four treatments, the first two had um, 90, or actually be 100 kilograms per hectare. These two here had 50 kilograms per hectare, which is 45 pounds. This treatment here uh, had no nitrogen fertilizer. And if you look at the stand, the stand is a little bit thinner, but uh, the big thing is that the plants are just a little bit smaller. Uh, you don't really see much difference in terms of color. I'd be hard pressed to see a difference in color. Just the plants are um, just a little bit uh, smaller. So they're probably suffering a bit from a, a nitrogen deficiency which does tell me that the nitrogen over here is releasing, but maybe not releasing quite as, quite as quickly as what we like, but the, the big factor is really uh, heat. Really what we want is uh, some sun and some heat to get these things uh, moving. I guess the other question is, you know, what could we do to have things looking better? What, what other kind of nitrogen fertilizer management could we have done differently? And not really a heck of a lot. You know, what, maybe what you could have done was maybe uh, band your fertilizer in the fall so it would have released uh, more quickly this spring. But this kind, these kind of environmental conditions are very, very unusual. So I'm, I would much prefer to see nitrogen go down uh, at the time of seeding in a direct seeding uh, situation. Um, and I guess maybe that's, that's kind of in a nutshell. Is there any questions about uh, ESN? I'm, I'm sure that most of you are very familiar with it and how it, how it functions. Any questions at all? I wouldn't mind um, going back to that question of the yellowing the, and the broadcasting fertilizer, mm -hmm. and you know, you, you, I think you said earlier that it's probably not worth doing. Right. Um, on so the early, early seeded stuff, is there any chance at this point that leaching is happening or not? Or okay, I wasn't wasn't going to go into too much detail, but you know, yeah. the, those are questions that the farmers are asking: Are we are we seeing leaching? 
and are we seeing denitrification? Odds are, if you kind of look back over the last two and a half months, we've only had one rainstorm that gave us more than 25 mils, which is an inch. So we've not had a lot of heavy storms, we've had a lot of frequent rains, but not to the point where we maybe see a lot of downward move movement. So I don't think, except for maybe very sandy soils, I really don't think we've seen much leaching. And then the other thing is, normally with uh, denitrification, where we have very wet conditions, uh, it takes that, then that nitrate starts to get converged, converted to uh, uh, nitrous oxide. Um, the soil conditions are, are such that like, the nitrogen is releasing very slowly, so we're not seeing a lot of huge amounts of nitrate in the soil. Plus the soils are cool. And so I don't think that the bacteria are really, uh, there's not, I don't really think there's a lot of conversion to the, the nitrous oxide, so I don't think we're really seeing all that much denitrification. So I think most of that nitrogen is probably still there. We're just, it just is gradually converting over. And then once things warm up, the, nitro, the nitrate will be there for the plants to take it up and they'll just take off. So I don't think we've seen a lot of, of losses. It's just a case of environmental conditions are causing that fertilizer to convert over slowly and the crops are uh, just not really growing the way they, they should. So the next question is, if the nitrogen is there, would it be worth it to broadcast on more nitrogen fertilizer? And my, my opinion is if we've not had a lot of loss, would it be worth it to go and broadcast another uh, 30 pounds of nitrogen on, onto the fields? In, in my mind, it'd be a, a waste of money. You're going to broadcast that fertilizer onto the, a moist soil. And then if we get a couple of warm days, looking ahead in the forecast, that doesn't look like it's going to happen in the next four or five days. But if you did, it, broadcast urea onto a moist soil, warm conditions, volatilization potential is huge. So you actually have to depend on a rain to move that urea into the soil. Then it's going to take two to three weeks for it to convert over to nitrate. Well, if and if you broadcast that fertilizer on today, uh, and we got a rain tonight to move it into the soil, it's going to be the first week of July before it's actually uh, available to the plant. And if you've already put a lot of nitrogen fertilizer down, ample nitrogen fertilizer down, would that really be worth it? And I would say maybe it might be if you kind of under fertilize for your yield potential, but if you fertilize for a good yield potential, maybe it's not even worth it. So those would be kind of my thoughts. From what I've seen so far, my opinion, and it's still an opinion because I don't think we have a solid definition, honestly, of what interrow seeding means. But to me, it is anywhere in between the stubble row that isn't directly on top of the stubble row. So it doesn't knock that stubble down. It doesn't interfere with uh, how that opener closes. And, you know, it's, a, it's kind of a big thing. They're, you know, it's a, it's a popular topic. They've been talking about it in that controlled traffic farming project that's going on. Um, I, I'm, I'm actually still somewhat interested in it because we have guidance on our plot work. So what we did is we found a site out south of town and we came up with the three treatments. So one of the treatment was we were gonna do our best to seed exactly on top of that stubble row. Then we we're gonna do another treatment where it was somewhere in between. And then the third one was, I'm just gonna drive up and seed. And we did get a chance to do some preliminary plant counts. And we have a statistical significant difference in plant stand establishment in canola compared to the on row versus the inter row. When you go out there and seed a field, do you think you're always on, on row? Yeah. Probably not. As a matter of fact, there's absolutely no difference from just driving up and seeding. And keep in mind, this is a field that was seeded with guidance uh, and then seeded last year and then seeded again on guidance on those same, that same degree path. Now, we're not seeing any visual difference between the just seeding on A-plus lines versus seeding on the row. But I, I do, I am convinced when, when we're seeding on top of that stubble roll, we're probably suffering a 10% uh, reduction in stand establishment. So anytime we're directly on top of that roll, we're losing 10%. And when we're talking about pretty expensive seed costs, I think that is something worth looking into. The other thing that I've noticed that in our winter wheat plots is um, anytime we were seeded on top of that roll, although we had the same amount of plants established, we're seeing a reduction in growth. So either a little bit shorter plant, a little bit less green, so there's a good chance that, and maybe Ross can comment on too, that there's potentially a mobilization due to that residue, root mass structure. I think on the canola plant stand, it has everything to do with how well did that furrow close? Are you dragging it out? The other thing we've noticed is that that seed is spread out a little bit more, and then we're getting into depth control issues. So do I think there's potential? Yes. Um, I'm, I'm not so sure that it's something that 
you know you have to jump up and down and buy RTK to do. I think we can do a pretty good job of it with just general guidance. So we're do we started off with this one plot. We're doing some general observations. Um, is there something there? Yes. Now it's just a matter of sorting it out. Uh, is it practical and is it better than what we're doing naturally? So for those of you that don't want to go out and see it, do you have any questions? Now that I kind of told the whole story, do those of you still want to go? <laughs> it's actually a really good drive um, southeast of town here. Uh, if you're anywhere else, you'll probably feel better by going out that way because it's ugly. <laughs> There's a lot of lakes, there's extreme yellowing. Uh, I mentioned even on the canola side of things, there's early seeded canola that's bolting and flowering. And it's really thin and spindly and ugly. It's under stress. I don't think it's supposed to be flowering now. Um, <laughs> and there's some pretty dramatic effects on what's going on with last year's crop. So I actually was, I was really, one thought that some somehow a guy was doing seed production on dry land, which is not possible. But it was all of the swaths from last year where the, the growth stage was so dramatically different from in between that it just slowed it down and, and just, I'm glad that's not my field, but it's a Hutterite colony, so you guys can drive by and feel good. <laughs> it's not yours, so. We'll, we'll get together with a few uh, a few truckloads and we'll head out there with, um, with those of you that like to go and we'll take a look. Otherwise, uh, I'd like to thank um, the folks that came, like Ross and uh, Troy, Scott Mears, that helped uh, contribute to the conversation. Thank you guys all for coming as well. We do have another one planned for next Thursday. It's going to focus more on, on, on Ross's work and Bob Blackshaw's work. So next Thursday, same time, same par um, parking lot meet. We started with this trial basically to see if in a row is a concept that is getting all the buzz about. Um, a lot of dealerships now are telling you that if you want to do a good job of inner row seeding, you need to be up to an RTK level of guidance. Um, for this particular plot here, we're using Omnistar, which is a Trimble's mid system of guidance. And we're running uh, three different strips. We have one strip that is seated directly on top of the stubble. Uh, the next strip is seated directly in between the stubble. And the next one is a check strip that basically we just drove up and seeded. From what we found so far with our plant counts and emergence, uh, the number with the check rows and the one in between rows, the plant counts are quite a bit higher than the one on rows. And there isn't actually a huge difference in between the direct inner rows and the check rows as well. So it's basically all just research from here. Uh, these pink flags out here, we actually have uh, uh, soil temperature monitors in there. Uh, they basically monitor the soil temperature for six weeks. And that, yeah, just is the, the basics of the trial. Different in, uh, in row, like the stuff that's planted on the road. Yeah, and and that's what we're testing too. Yeah, that's yeah. that's what we're trying to see if that's a factor or not. So they say. Yeah. Uh, that's why we test it. Yeah. Okay. What about? Um, are you guys doing any research as far as like where you're going to be placing the seed in the middle? Like for example. Um, like in your row here, doing one row right on this side, like the first third, and then the next year when you seed it, you should be seeding here. And then hopefully that row will be broken down enough so you can go back to there. Because if you seed right in the middle, where are you gonna seed next year? That's kind of where, the, <laughs> that, that's where the whole inner row, where do you seed exactly, right? Yeah. Yeah. Comes into the argument. With our straight inner row plots, we made sure that we did everything we could that we were seeding directly in the middle because most people, that's where they think it should be. The check rows were just, Basically try not to cause any disturbance to the stubble and see where that heads out and see what we get for results. Yeah, we're really honestly still in the whole proof of concept stage when it comes down to it because there's been a whole bunch of talk about it and a whole bunch of people interested in doing it, but is there any concrete evidence that it's something that's worthwhile doing? And when it comes to canola in particular, I think I can say confidently that we want to avoid seeding directly on top of the road. Is there a difference between seed in the middle versus an inch beside the stubble? I haven't seen it personally yet, but I mean, that's something that we want to figure out. What I have noticed for sure, and I think what we should do is literally come in and take a look at some of the plots, is that the stand has been muddled. Anytime we've got a plot where we've seeded on top of a row, this is supposed to be an inter row. This is on a 
Oh, and we did do the, the other thing that Brent didn't mention is that we had two openers. We did the stealth opener and the disc opener. They're very different from disturbing stuff. Whenever we get really close to this stubble roll, we notice that the, the canola is getting kind of muddled. It's spread out. It's not a nice clean row anymore. So that tells me that there's issues in closing that furrow with that packer wheel. So you're saying that maybe any differences we're seeing is more a cedar difference than whether you're in the stubble or not, than a plant difference? I think that Because the cedar works better in between the rows than it does in the rows. Yeah, I am saying that. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I agree. Yeah. So I'm I mean, there, there's all these other benefits that people are, are, you know, they're trying to jump up. The other thing that Brent's going to be looking at is weed population. So if you're seeding directly in between the row and you're, you're hoping to cover that canopy quicker, you know, there's less area for that weed to have that competitive area essentially to grow instead of like on top of that stubble. There's a chance that we might see shifts in weed population. But the big finding that we're seeing is that if you're using guidance, period, using auto steer on a wasp system low end whatever and you're using the same lines for the most part you're hitting that you know somewhere probably 70 to 90 percent what i would call interrow seeding without trying so is it worth it taking that extra 10 percent step to get to a high level gps um i don't know that's the question we'd like to be able to answer i think if we can try to do a good job of getting in between, leaving the standing stubble as much as we can, that's gonna end up being a benefit no matter where we go. So how do you find your crops come up, Josh, with stripper header? Like, have you literally gone out there, you know, you use guidance, you're not trying to do intro seeding. How much do you think's in between the rows? Are you I not have no that? rows. <laughs> it's all trash, right? Yeah. Like Ross McKenzie was in a place well, it had more trash than this, and he was saying, like, he's got some plots, and he's like, boy, that's sure a trashy canola field, eh? And I looked at it, I said, that's my bearish field, Ross. Um, so you just have complete yeah. resin cover. Actually, cover. we, the way our disc drill, that such that tall stubble, the openers, they kind of cut, and that stubble is so tall, it kind of naturally just pushes that stubble to the side. So actually, with the actual standing stubble, you're in between it almost all the time. You're yeah. never really. That's what that's what we've been experiencing too. And even if you're on row, sometimes that stubble will move over right. and it'll flow around the opener, and the packer wheel actually pushes it back down. So, and I noticed we have to prove worth beyond just an aesthetic thing, and that's a little tricky. And I noticed with like we got a fairly decent opener with our disc opener. I'm not. It seems if you're in the trash, it, it does just as good a job, like your emergence is just as good, because we're evaluating some different openers or different seed boots this year. So there's lots of times I put the two hired guys on the drill and I was an hour just digging behind them. And it seems to, it doesn't seem to matter so too the, much. So our preliminary counts, to me those are interesting because our on-row stuff, which is where we did our best to literally go on top of the rows, we saw a 10% reduction in, in uh, canola emergence. 10% is significant. You know, that's that's gonna cost some dollars, or especially when guys are really trying to push the bottom limits of seed rates when it comes to canola. So, but are guys going out and seeding directly on the rows on yeah, purpose? No, exactly. No, that's where it comes back to a proof of concept thing. Yeah. How much of a difference do you think that a type of stubble would be? Like, if you have, like, barley versus wheat versus canola versus pulse? Yeah, I, I think there would be a difference for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think all cereals would be very similar. Mm -hmm. uh, peas obviously are much different. They're much uh, softer above ground residue. I and mean, there's two types of residue, above ground and below ground. So is, is the below ground stuff um, doing anything? I think potentially it is. And I, I mentioned that on the winter wheat trials too, where we were using guidance on both. Wherever we were right on top of that row, that winter wheat just didn't look near as good. And I think it had to do with honestly a mobilization of nutrients more than anything so it just wasn't getting that access to nutrients because of it was so close to that that bound of straw from last year so whenever you have high carbon residue uh, left behind it tends to immobilize your nitrogen and, and maybe that's what we're seeing as a localized immobilization of, of nutrients have you taken like i don't know what you're doing with soil temperatures have you taken differences in soil temperature like right in the middle of the row versus yes. right here. Yeah, that's, that's what exactly we're doing right now with these. Okay. Yeah. I'll let you talk about that. 
Uh, we don't have any results to talk about it yet because yeah. they're still in the ground. They're yeah, they come out next week. Yeah. Because I've been playing like with my just, I just got a hand thermometer. I can just shove in like Monsanto gave it to me or something. I don't seem to notice much difference with my tall subble between. I was just curious. If you guys I don't think we would see any difference either. This this trial's been giving us a neat opportunity to look at short stubble versus tall stubble because it was combined back and forth this way. So we're, we're trying to take some measurements within the short stubble, the taller stubble, to see if there's any differences. But I don't know. My bet is that there's very little temperature difference. Uh, I think that argument's probably wrong, but it's still a little early to tell for sure. So you guys want to walk through and look at some of the treatments and maybe Brent if you can sort of find some of those on rolls that you can tell were really spread out. Mm -hmm. What's the difference in disc and hole openers, Brent? Ours were the, the pillar laser disc versus yeah. the the stealth paired roll opener. Same stuff that we were looking at back Right, but is uh, are you seeing a bigger difference in one versus the other? The disc is a lot cleaner than what we're finding right now. Less um, disturbance. A lot less disturbance. Definitely. Yeah. I think I think in terms of the, the actual plant count data, there wasn't a, a significant. Not statistically different, but numerically, I think it was a slight difference. Yeah. Moisture has a very high heat capacity, so the wetter it is, the more heat it will hold. You can see here where we've actually ripped the stubble up. Maybe drier, there is a chance that it might be more of a different stubble. Yeah. Yeah. And it is, they stay static, so it doesn't But the big thing that take a look at this stuff. Well, it's like it goes in, but you can, like, at least here I can show the disturbance that we did make. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this is what I was going to talk about. <laughs> this is all the on row. I'll wait for Morton to come over. Fire away. So this particular piece here was uh, done with the hoe, uh, the hoe opener, and this was directly on the row. And even when we were going on the row, what we found is sometimes the stubble would get ripped up, or the stubble would even just move out of the way and come back in. Um, this area we had a lot of disturbance on it, and kind of see how if we were to look at this then go look at one of the discs that were in between the row you can see a huge difference in between the establishment well, there's even a difference exactly so how deep did you try to see it uh, went in i believe at two centimeters did you find that any of them laid on top uh the odd spot so we, you do, we did have a lot cleaner seating with the this side of things as opposed to the whole. But in terms of the on row for the research side of things, it's right a couple Yeah, cut right through, eh? Yeah. My gut says a whole machine. Yeah. Intro might pay more on a whole machine, eh? Yes, I think so. I, I think if you're going to do a lot of it, though, a, dris, a distro is a better way to go. Just from what we've seen so far for establishing. Yeah. I've had four goals, four goals. Pretty much a stripper header, so I get stubble. Disc drills, the only way to 
machine. Well, the first year it was a I did a 30-foot ATO motor. I did all the stuff on the I think I was in grade 8 or 9 then, but yeah, every day after school, I'd fire up the mower and mow for 10 hours after school and try to get enough done. And then even as to what Ken mentioned earlier, even on this on-row stuff, you can even see the weeds and volunteers sneaking in, more so as opposed to the in-row. Yeah, because they've got the space in the room. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah you and found a great spot to stop here, right? Eh? Yeah. So then you're, you're showing when you're bringing up these lumps. Yep. It spreads out the roll. So you're still gonna get a crop, yeah. but if, you wanna, if you're one of these guys that wants to cut down to three pounds an acre, this is what you gotta avoid. Problem is, in a year like this, you'll get away with it. Yeah. And then but at the go, same oh, time, everybody says earlier. this year was so yeah, great. Exactly. I've seen some pretty uh, terrible emergence on the uh, Dryer year. Yeah, dryer, old paper. Yeah, and then you're going to. The long and the short of it. You were talking about uh, canola and seedbed utilization. Like, I use a disc opener. So I have, I mean, I got a trench that wide, and that's it. Yeah, you're very narrow. So I have nothing like the Paired Row Stealth. So would I be better off to go to like a seven inch spacing to get more seat bed utilization, get more openness? Well, that would give you more. But then would inner row be harder to do inner row, right? It would be. There's a different school of thought. Some people would like to go wider on right. canola. Um, all my experience so far has shown that more seedbed utilization, you will get better plant stand established. However, canola is extremely good at compensating. You know, it branches out really well. So if you're looking at really lowering seed rates, like really getting crazy about it, then I would say, yeah, you should increase your seed rate. And sometimes that, you know, like a three inch spreader tip on a three year trial that we did was always the highest plant stand but it didn't always correlate with yield. And then you got to think about levels of risk that you're willing to accept. Because mm -hmm. yeah, there's always trade-offs. We talked about things like thinner stands, environmental conditions. And, you know, lots of times we're getting 50% seedling mortality in canola. That's why we're that's why trying to find things. And if canola stays strong, you, you can bet that seed prices are going to stay strong. And there's, there's actually a movement towards getting more precise seeding, like like individual placement, like a, like a, like a corn type plant or, mm -hmm. canola. That's, or, or how sugar beets use plates, same idea. And that, that probably would be a good thing, because I think there's actual in, uh, competition within itself, the canola plant, which is why the seed, I think spreading it out helps. Because if you concentrate everything in narrow rows, then it competes with itself. So, you, you're going to see good good emergence simply because of the, the moisture benefits that you have in the narrow disc, but I'm not positive that it's actually the best way to see the you know, Half a dozen of one, half a dozen of one. Yeah. My stripper stubble, I have no choice. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's the system you've chosen, so you kind of have to deal with it. Right? And I never have to seed to moisture, even in a dry and we've year. Had a I always have of, moisture, yeah. right? We've had a couple of wet years. Now guys are really thinking about getting into more disturbance. That same New Holland guy said uh, they've sold more cultivators this year than they have in a long time. So, you know, short-term thinking and we could yeah. come into 10 years of drought. And things I saw a 60-foot Fergstad cultivator, an old one, like a 1980-something or other, go for 50 grand at an auction. Well, <laughs> I know. I'm going. Yeah, I know. you're I know. Out we just finished selling all this.